My name is Dr. Colleen Jay. I am one of the transplant surgeons here at Wake Forest and the director of the Living Kidney Donor Program. And I am here with Dr. Perkle, one of our um, fantastic kidney specialists here at Wake Forest, and Lynette Cox, who works as our living donor navigator. Um, as a living donor navigator, Lynette works um, to educate and coach our patients who are being evaluated for a kidney transplant on how to look for a donor. And um, she is also herself a recipient of a living donor and a preemptive transplant, meaning transplant before requiring dialysis. Today, Dr. Perkle, Lynette, and I wanted to talk to um, folks about um, prevention and early detection of kidney disease and also equitable access to care, which is the theme for this year's World Kidney Day 2020. Um, so starting with you, Dr. Perkle, can you uh, tell, tell us more about what is kidney disease and what are the symptoms one would notice if they're having problems with their kidneys? Yes, yeah, so the kidneys are like giant filters for our bodies. So as we eat and live and breathe and move, our bodies constantly generate waste products and the kidneys help us filter those waste products and extra fluid out of the blood. Now, kidney disease is basically any time the kidneys have sustained damage and are not able to do that well. So sometimes people are born with damaged kidneys. Sometimes they may have an autoimmune disease or a genetic disease that might damage their kidneys over time. One of the most common causes of kidney disease in this country is actually type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, whatever the cause, as the kidneys become damaged over time and become scarred, they're not able to get rid of those waste products as well. And when those waste products build up in the blood, it makes people not feel well. So um, what are those symptoms that they may notice then? And do, does everyone feel symptoms when they have kidney damage? That's a great question. Um, one of the slightly scary things about kidney disease is that it can, people cannot have symptoms, especially in the early stages. Some people think that, oh, because I'm making urine, my kidneys must be working fine. But unfortunately, even in late stage kidney disease, the kidneys can continue to make a normal amount of urine. So that's not a good sign for us to follow. Early in kidney disease, one of the things we may actually see is a high blood pressure. So the kidneys are the master regulators of blood pressure. And if we see the blood pressure going up, we might actually suspect, hey, I wonder if something's wrong in the kidneys. Mm -hmm. Later on in the kidney disease, as we mentioned, as the waste products build up to higher levels, people will feel sick. So they will feel fatigue, inability to concentrate, so maybe not able to read a book, itchy, not sleeping well, and then the taste for food is really altered. So they may feel a funny, sour taste in their mouth. And when they get a plate of food that they usually really enjoy, they smell it and they get nauseated and they don't want to eat it. And they may even throw up, so. So in addition to getting your blood pressure checked regularly, are there any other tests or screening that they should be discussing with their doctors? That's a great question. So yes, I agree with getting the blood pressure checked. That should be done at least annually. And if your blood pressure is higher than 120, you should have it checked more often. And if you're on medicine for blood pressure or that's becoming the case, I would recommend talking to your doctor about a test for kidney disease. Now the only way, and this is important, the only way to diagnose kidney disease is through a blood test. So your doctor can order a blood test for a creatinine and that shows us how, at what level the waste products are in the blood and can indicate to us whether there's a problem in the kidneys. Another important test they can do that can detect kidney disease sometimes early on is a test in the urine. And when they test the urine for protein. Now protein usually should not come through the filters and be secreted in the urine. So if we see protein in the urine, that can be a sign to us that there's some early kidney damage. Okay, great, that's super helpful. Um, you you kind of started to mention this before, but who would you say are the patients that are most at risk for developing kidney disease? So the patients most at risk are gonna be those with a family history, so especially a mom or dad with kidney disease, those with high blood pressure and or diabetes, um, and cigarette smoking is also a risk factor for kidney disease. So really have to think if you're in one of those groups. And are there things that um, patients can do to reduce their risk of developing kidney disease? Yes, so kidney disease is very similar to some of these other Western uh, civilization type diseases that we've seen rise a lot over the past 200 years, like heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. And we all know that our lifestyle and diet has changed you know, a lot during that time. So I encourage people to, to look at those things and try to avoid the things that have changed that may be contributing. So when it comes to diet, I recommend three things. Number one, I recommend avoid added, avoiding added sugar 
in the diet. Uh, sugar wasn't really around a lot before you know the 1800s, and that's been something that's been very new, and it's in a lot of the food that we eat now. Number two is to avoid processed foods. So when you go to the grocery store, try to avoid the middle area and shop the fresh food on the perimeter, you know? And number three, try to eat a broad range of healthy and nutritious foods that you cook at home. When you cook at home, you know, you have more control over what you're getting, right? And if you don't cook, learn how. It's a lot of fun, actually. So um, another thing I recommend is exercise. And exercise does not have to be dramatic. So some light walking or some, some simple weights or resistant exercises at home can really pay dividends. And finally, I recommend good sleep. So seven to eight hours of good, high-quality sleep is, is it's actually very important. If you have a sleep problem or you don't sleep well, talk to a sleep doctor and get that treated. It can really help. That's great. So for folks who aren't successful in avoiding advanced kidney disease, how do you treat um, late or you know, end-stage kidney disease? So kidney disease, we do have some medicines that help to take the stress off the kidneys in addition to those lifestyle changes. But for folks where, and, and for folks with autoimmune diseases that are attacking the kidney, we have some immune type medicines that may help cure those patients actually. But for folks that do progress and have chronic scarring and some high um, waste product levels, uh, we have a couple of options. So first we have dialysis. And dialysis is a procedure that uh, takes the place of the kidney function to some extent. So it helps us remove waste products and extra fluid from the body. And it actually helps people feel a lot better because they get those toxin levels removed. The other thing we can do is we can transplant a new kidney into the patient and that kidney will then take over and do the job. And of course, that's the way we prefer if, it's a, if we're able to do that. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And so at Wake Forest, we're lucky enough to work with a group of kidney specialists that are really good about referring patients early to transplant because we know that early referral to transplant um, results in better outcomes for our patients. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, early referral is not enough by itself to overcome our wait list issues. And at this moment, there's more than 95,000 people on the List um, for a kidney, and the average wait times across the country are four years or more. Some places as um, long as a nine-year average wait time. And so, the only way for patients to end this wait for many patients is for them to find a living donor. And in fact, many patients are at higher risk of dying on the wait list before they can find um, are ever offered a kidney from the deceased donor list. So, we know that reducing the time they spend on dialysis results in better survival, and getting a transplant before they need dialysis. Um, like Lynette was able to do, has the ex um, best expected survival. So we believe very strongly that our living donors are our heroes that help us um, save the lives of our patients. And really that's not just the recipient that they donate to, but it's um, every patient on the wait list. By removing someone from the list, they help shorten everyone's wait time. Um, but you know, nobody knows this better than you do, <laughs> Lynette. So I was hoping you could um, kind of share with us how you first um, learned about living donor transplant. My nephrologist um, actually told me about living donors because he was able to have a discussion with me when I was first diagnosed. Um, I was diagnosed in stage three, so I had a little time to prepare and plan and hopefully change things around if I could. If I could not, I was able to actually speak with my uh, nephrologist, ask questions of what I need to do moving forward. Um, one of the things that he had said was um, looking for a living donor um, because I told him that I did not want to do dialysis if I could help it. So he was able to actually listen to me and uh, told me that I needed to go ahead and start having that discussion with my family, with my friends, and seeing if I can have or find a living donor. Yeah, so a lot of patients tell us they don't feel t comfortable talking to people about being their donor. And I guess I would wonder what you would share with them about what the best way is to get more comfortable and how you got more comfortable yourself in being able to share your story and talk to people about living donation. Correct. Um, it's not easy looking for a living donor. Um, it's not easy letting people know what your personal health issues are but it's very important to do so. Um, I found that out myself. Uh, I didn't tell anyone about my situation until dialysis was actually mentioned, that I was getting closer to that point. And I was like, oh no, that was the one thing that actually put fire underneath me to, to seek a living donor. So the first thing that I did was speak with my family. I spoke with my family and they were actually my voice. 
they were my advocates. They were the ones that was going out and um, actually spreading the word on my behalf. And um, as I got comfortable, I was able to go out and start speaking with uh, my close friends. So I think it's very important for people to understand that you go to your family, um, your support system, um, and they will be the ones to actually help you spread the word. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to do it by yourself. I think that's very important um, to hear. Um, and for your experience with getting transplanted before starting dialysis, how, mm -hmm. how did avoiding dialysis impact your life? Um, it was a really, really great relief to know that I did not have to do dialysis. Um, my biggest fear with dialysis was actually the things that I would have to give up or felt like I had to give up. Um, when you were on dialysis, usually it's uh, the three days a week uh, for so many hours for each time. And you have to basically plan your life around dialysis. And I didn't want to have to do that if I could help it. It was hard enough for me to actually wrap my mind around the fact that I had kidney disease uh, itself. So just being able to skip that part and just go straight to transplant was wonderful. It was a lot of things that I did not have to experience because I was able to skip dialysis. Um, I know one of the things was um, I didn't have to take as much medications okay. because I was able to skip dialysis. But thank you for sharing all that, including your personal experiences. Mm -hmm. Kind of shifting gears to your role now as a professional educator, mm -hmm. um, I think the advice you gave about having your family support you and help you share your story is a very important one. Yes. Uh, but you know, you see all sorts of folks and some folks have less support from their family or have less family around. Mm -hmm. What other kind of things do you advise um, patients to do who are trying to um, find a living donor? Yes. Um, first of all, everybody's family is um, not able to be that support system or be that donor um, per se because they have the same disease. It runs in the family. High blood pressure, diabetes is very, very common. So you have to look outside of your family, your friends, your um, church, your um, other organizations, clubs that you are part of. Even Facebook is considered a community group. So Facebook, social media, that's the biggest uh, tool that we suggest that you use because you can reach out to so many different people. Um, they have different avenues that you can use through Facebook, like Facebook Live. So there are tools that you can use. Even um, using t-shirts, like the one that I have, uh, you can advertise and show that you are in need of a kidney transplant, you're seeking a living donor, and contact information. And it don't have to have just those words. It can have something that will reflect you, who you are, your personality. You can have a sense of humor. Um, however, you need to get the word out. The important thing is to get the word out um, and tap into other people's resources that's available to you. Yeah, so I know from talking to you, but also talking from our kidney donors, one thing has become increasingly clear to me in time is um, a lot of folks don't need to be asked to donate a kidney, but they do need to hear about a specific person and their need for a kidney donor and what that means to them personally and their family. And just sharing that need is often enough uh, impresses upon those um, who are willing to donate the, the interest in coming forward. And it's not so much about asking. Mm -hmm. And I know you and I always, too, um, refocus patients about not worrying about blood types, but just encouraging right. anyone who's interested in finding out more about donation about coming forward, because we are doing more and more kidney swaps nowadays. So even for incompatible blood types, you can still save someone's life by being their donor. Right. Um, so I think all of that is, um, super helpful and just those folks who are out there trying to think about how to find a kidney donor. Um, you know, Dr. Perkle, in closing, maybe um, can you share with us what you think um, about Wake Forest um, kidney program makes it so unique in terms of these things we've been talking about? Well, I'm very glad to be here. Wake Forest has long been a national leader uh, in kidney care and um, as a matter of fact, some of the research into the genetic causes of kidney disease originated right here at Wake Forest. Um, I think you can be 
rest assured that you will receive the cutting edge, you know, in diagnosis and treatment options, you know, when you come and have your care here. So, and I would just like to say, in addition to the top-notch CKD and um, end-stage renal, um, or sorry, chronic kidney disease and end-stage um, kidney disease care that's provided by Dr. Pop, uh, Perkle and his colleagues here, um, you know, our transplant program continues to strive to provide the um, most access to transplant and reduce wait times. And gratefully, we can claim some of the shortest wait times in the state. But I think uh, that is only uh, in thanks in part to our living donors who are a critical aspect of this. And so um, as such, we, we offer minimally invasive donor surgery, um, enhanced recovery pathways for the donors, and ki uh, kidney swaps and exchanges, which I mentioned is something um, that we're seeing more of, not just here at Wake Forest, but across the country. Um, along with that, we um, are blessed to see more and more folks who are what we call non-directed donors come forward. And those are um, people in the community who come forward who just want to help someone. They, they don't have a personal loved one or family member that needs a transplant, but they know that they want to help save someone's life by donating this gift. And they really make a uh, number of things possible for folks who otherwise wouldn't get transplanted. So for anyone interested in finding out more about living donation um, or seeing if they can personally become a living donor, they just need to email us. Um, they can email us at livingdonation at wakehealth.edu um, or they can check out our website which provides more information about living donation um, and that's at wakehealth.edu uh, forward slash living donor. Um, anything else? from either of you. I would like to add one thing if I could. Mm -hmm. um, from being a patient um, standpoint, I know that Wake Forest actually is a very personable. Our um, transplant team, and I can say now our transplant team, mm -hmm. um, actually uh, we're very personable. So when you come here, you can expect for that personal one-on-one -on -one connection with the whole team. You're not just a patient. Um, you're actually someone that we are trying to help through this process to give you as much information as we can possibly give you to help you through this process. Um, so coming to Wake Forest, you have a great team on your side. Yeah, and I will just say we couldn't provide that kind of care without the multidisciplinary team that we have here. And so that means folks like Lynette, who um, takes a big role in educating our patients, and it also means working with our referring nephrologists like Dr. Perkle, who not only um, help take care of patients before they need transplant, but help us care for our patients after they've been transplanted as well. So.